Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. It's good to have everybody here this morning. We're celebrating this morning our 10th year anniversary of being on this campus. Oh, is today so the day? Today is the day. Yep. So we'll do a free food and games and everything going on after after church. So from one to one to four. So you know, stay if you can. And I'm sure the service will reflect 10 years on this campus. It's amazing that we've been here for 10 years already. So it just it boggles boggles my mind. So. But hey, we're going to uh, pick up where we left off on uh, praying with power, and I invited uh, any of our alumni chaplains that wanted to come in. Uh, we got two of them that are here, Marilyn Watson and Angie Gonzalez, who both went through the chaplain program, and so they're, they're with us again today because we constantly are using these uh, dynamics, and uh, we just need to continually always do upgrading information and just continue with education, so uh, every time we have, probably have quite a few of our classes here all invite uh, the alumni just to come in if they want to kind of just get further training. It even helps to, for them to add, you know, different things they've experienced uh, uh, at the altar and stuff like that, testimonies they have. It really helps do that. Now, Pastor Sherry was supposed to be teaching this, but uh, as we were talking before <laughs> class, she's got grandma duty right now since my daughter just uh, had her little, little daughter this weekend. So. Congratulations. Yeah, okay. Everybody's doing great. Everybody's home. And... Uh, we had the two-year-old for a couple nights in a row, so that's where Sherry's at. We head back over to our daughter's house and stuff, to, so mom can get a little bit of rest and stuff. So, all right. Well, hey, let's open with a word of prayer, and we'll uh, pick up where we left off. And someone will have to remind me exactly where that's at, but uh, we'll pick up where we left off. Father, we just bless you this morning. God, just uh, thank you, Lord, for just a beautiful day outside today. And Lord, I thank you for all of those that are in this room this morning, all the different homes that are represented. I just speak a blessing over their lives today, God. God, thank you for this campus. Lord, thank you for uh, vision. Lord, thank you for uh, that we're celebrating 10 years uh, on this campus. Lord, so many people's lives touched and changed. And we just pray, Lord, let the next 10 years even be a double portion mm, of what these last 10 years were. God, we just want you to touch, deliver, heal, change and just fill people's lives and Lord that you would use every single one of us God to be those vessels that touch influence and encourage people's lives so Lord we just bless you today and God I just pray you speak through each of us during this uh, teaching today Lord that just the power of the Holy Spirit I just say God just Thank stir you, every single one of us afresh and anew this morning and God, we just love you. We just bless you this morning, God. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. 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 We've got this. We've got this book here, and I know uh, Angie, uh, Marilyn, you guys don't have this. We can maybe kind of look on it. You know what, Angie? In the box right back behind you, there's probably a couple different ones there. Get one for you and Marilyn if you wouldn't mind. Um, what we did, we were talking about the uh, the uh, place of altar. And what the altar is, you know what? What we're wanting to do here, as we as we teach this, in every place every place you go has got a different uh, concept, a different way they do uh, their ministry times, their altar times, and you know as we talked about last uh, last week, uh, we were talking about how unique, uh, or, or you all were talking about how unique Skyway is uh, from where you used to go to church. The fact that we have the open altar and uh, how we do our altar calls or how we do our altar ministry and because of the size of our church it's very very important as we do this training that we've got all of our chaplains and then there might be some people that are up there doing the altar ministry that they're not chaplains but they've taken the altar ministry and uh, what we want to do is we want to have pastor greg's heart you know mm -hmm. number one it's enough for us to you know kind of go through get training get this teaching but to know the these are not just rules or regulations or something, <clears throat> but this is how Pastor Greg views us allowing God, the Holy Spirit, to touch through us. Because you can go to a, a lot of different places and the, the dynamics people will use, how people pray for people. Uh, some might be really loud and boisterous and... You know, just, there's just different dynamics or different styles, I guess, is a better way to put that. And so what we're learning here is, uh, yes, we're going over what the protocol is and what we do and stuff like that, but this is coming from Pastor Greg's heart, so that we know whenever we're praying for people, he knows that we're safe, 
and the people know that we are safe as we pray for people because I don't know throughout your years you know of, of being prayed for and going to church and stuff sometimes you might have had somebody that prayed for you that kind of might have been a little bit scary or if you just barely uh, started uh, kind of having people pray for you, maybe they did something weird or they, you know, um, I don't know, had some little quirky thing they did or whatever. And what we're wanting to do is, you know, it's not what we do that touches people. It's not the uh, formula or, you know, those type of things. It's, a, it's allowing the Holy Spirit just to flow through us because the Holy Spirit touches people. If it's you that touches people, that will only last for a little bit of time, and it won't be by the Spirit anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you can have really good head knowledge and do some things right, but, you know, what we're wanting to do at that place of altar is we're wanting people's lives to be changed. And how they get changed is they get changed by the Holy Spirit. And hopefully all of you have gone through enough training already um, that when you, when you go through the training, uh, hopefully you've gone through enough training to where you're not doing uh, ministry for approval. You know what I mean? So you you do it from acceptance, not for acceptance. What happens uh, in a lot of people's lives is what they do is to fill a need in their lives because they have a need to be needed. They'll get into ministry, but yet they'll it'll be more out of the soulish realm than it will out of the spirit. What I mean by that is they'll constantly want to have people around them, constantly want to be counseling, constantly want to be doing this so that they can feel good about themselves. And really what it kind of does, it fills a need. Because what you really should be about doing is turning people over to God. Exactly. You, you want to counsel with them, you want to lead them, you want to encourage them, but you don't want them to rely, rely on you only. Because that is a, that's a formula for burnout, that's a formula for disaster. Uh, a codependent type of relationship. It can be a soul type relationship. And hopefully you guys have gotten enough teaching, or, or I'll just reiterate it, today you've got enough teaching to where you, you want to raise people up or as you're, as you're praying for people or maybe counseling people uh, type of thing, even though we don't counsel as chaplains, but what you want to do is point them towards the Lord. And that's where they, because where does their strength come from? Does their strength come from Irene? Does their strength come from Pastor Sam? You know, the answer to that is absolutely no. And the thing is, when people really need the Lord to 3 o'clock in the morning, you don't want your phone to be ringing. You might get those calls every now and again, but that's okay. It needs to be less and not more. And basically, we need to, to turn the word to the Lord. Because again, as you come up the leadership pipeline, people will start drawing from you. And they'll be looking at you. But the thing, what we want to do, our goal is to... Um, Turn them, you know, turn them back to the Lord. We encourage them, we teach them, we train them, we pray for them. But where their help comes from is their help comes from God, okay? And even though that doesn't have, well, it does have a lot to do with the praying and stuff because what happens when you begin to pray, there's this deal that happens where people can actually get a bond when someone's praying. Because why? Because you minister to their heart. You pray <coughs> for them. You help them maybe on a spiritual level, but you also probably help them on a soulish or an emotional level. Yeah. Uh, level, and when you help someone on an emotional level, that's why you have to be really careful about emotional soul ties, mm -hmm. and that's why one of the points we'll talk about a little bit later is we prefer to have men pray with men, women pray with women, because that if we do you go the other route, that can be a recipe uh, for disaster. Doesn't start off that way; starts off um, innocent, very uh, you know natural, just praying for someone. But I'll just say a lot of times. Uh, ladies' emotional needs are even that much more if they get a guy that pays attention to them mm -hmm. without even thinking that becomes yeah. a soul tie, can become a soul tie very, very fast. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that happen throughout the years a lot, a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, just a couple guys in this class, but, you know, guys, if for some reason, and it, this will be one of the points, but I'll just say it since I'm on this, this vein right now, and ladies also, if there's someone from the opposite sex that needs prayer and it's like we've got, you know, there's just so many people around, as opposed to praying for that person, grab another uh, team member, grab a, somebody from the opposite sex when you're praying for them. Same thing with ladies versus guys, you know, that, that type of thing. So, uh, But the, the emotional needs that the ladies have are a lot, lot stronger, and we've, just, we've seen some things that have just not gone, you know, well. So we want to protect that. So the very, very number, number, number one thing is women pray for women, men pray for men. Okay? But if for some reason, which eventually if you're in ministry for a period of time, that's going to end up happening, and uh, you just have to watch that. And, you know, as you go along, you get in ministry, you start knowing people, and you, you might see some people that will pray, but I'm just saying the rule of thumb is men pray with men, and women pray 
pray with women, okay? So anyway, let's let's go on to the let's get on the teaching here. I want to talk about the altar here a little bit. It's on page eleven. And then what I'm going to do is just talk about this a little bit, and then I'm going to go over this sheet that I hand out to you. I apologize for those of you who got lousy three-hole punches. Um, <laughs> I couldn't find a good one, and I uh, messed up on some of the three-hole three -hole punches this morning. So, the altar. At church, and not even at church, but what you can remember, any place that you go, any place that you're praying for someone, whether you're in a rest home, you're in a care facility, uh, you're in a home, uh, you're in a hospital. You're here at um, you're here at the altar here at Skyway Church. What you always want to remember is you want to remember how important the importance of what the altar is, because we take that along with us. We take presence along with us. So wherever something, wherever you're praying for someone, you're actually establishing. You can actually be establishing an altar actually at that place if you're thinking about it. Now, Pastor Greg has the the teaching where he's talking about the significance of the altar and sanctifying the altar. Is now, every, we went through this, didn't I? Discussed yes, yes. all this already, yes. okay, with you and you know, uh, Angie, Marilyn, you guys have kind of gone through this. So, let me just hit the, the bullets. You know, on page 11, it just talks about the biblical revelation that Pastor Greg got at the altar, and that's just basically summarizing it is a place where people's lives are touched and it's changed. That's the bottom line. But these, uh, uh, just I'll just highlight these bold things. It's a place of revelation. So people will be getting a revelation there at that altar. It's a place of decision. When people come forward, they're coming forward usually to make uh, a decision. If they're not coming just to be in the presence of God, to receive revelation, they're coming forward because <clears throat> of the altar call or whatever Pastor Greg has said or a speaker has said. They're coming forward. Why? Because they're wanting to make a decision. And what they're doing is they're exercising their faith. Yes. It's a place of a renewed covenant. A lot of people will come to the altar. <clears throat> Really, the Baptist church that I used to go to, there's only two reasons you came to an altar. You know, you came to get saved or you came to rededicate your life. So you were either getting saved or you were so messed up that was why you were back down there. So a lot of times, people really didn't go to the altar very much because you're either getting saved or like, oh man, this person's, they've been backsliding and they're coming down to renew their faith or rededicate their life. And that's the terminology we, we would use in the Baptist church. You know, thank God, you know, we just, our altar is full every single Sunday. Full during worship, full during the ministry times, and you know nobody knows what someone is, what's going on in somebody's life. And you know what? That's how it needs to be, because that's just between them and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So a place of renewed covenant. <clears throat> it's a place to sacrifice. You know, I'll decrease, Lord, that you would increase. So it's a lot of places in which you people renew. Uh, you know, hey, where they're going with God. It's a place to call upon the Lord, and that's one thing that as we get into some of these bullet points. You know, I'll just kind of talk about this for just a second. You know, just because someone is up at the altar doesn't necessarily uh, mean that they need us to pray for them. Amen. Um, they can just be up there worshiping. And even sometimes, um, you know, you need to be very careful as a chaplain or a leader. And, you know, maybe the Lord's putting somebody on your heart. You really want to run it through the filter. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is ask a couple different times if you really feel you're supposed to go and pray for somebody. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times people will just come up and all they want to do is just get along with God. Mm -hmm. And That's we don't right. want to interrupt that. Uh, interaction because again who's the one that changes people's lives God does you know it's through the power of the Holy Spirit it's not us now you know if the Lord is really drawing you to someone again what I say when I say run it through the filters just you know process it again ask the Lord Lord do you really want me to go and do this and if you feel the answer is yes and maybe you have a, uh, a word uh, of encouragement word of wisdom form or something that's cool you know to be able to go and do and stuff and then you just go up and say hey I really felt I had this impression. Is it okay if I pray for you? You know, that sort of thing. And that usually works out. But I just want to just remind you, hey, that altar is a place where we call upon the Lord. That's a place where people can just worship. So not always is somebody up there just waiting for someone to come up and pray for them. I read. The, the couple doesn't go here anymore, or the lady. But when I was new here, the music, I'd never heard the music, and I had never heard this <laughs> type of worship. So I would go up. And yell at the altar, weeping with the music, the right. worship. I'd be weeping and weeping, weeping. The same woman would come every Sunday <laughs> and tell me my life was going to get better, <laughs> that whatever I had done wrong, God had forgiven oh, me from. Oh, and oh, I would pray, Lord, God, get her away from me. I quit going up to the altar. Right. And I changed sides from the church. From the west side, I moved all the way to the east side. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And then one lady came up. She said, Sister, I have prayed for you all night. Satan wants to get you. Satan wants to steal you. But I told Satan you're not stealing her and taking it away because he's taking you this way. And I went and I said, God, get them away from me. <laughs> get them away uh, from so me. So those are, those are good That's examples good of what's called a religious yeah. spirit. Yeah. Just because yeah. someone might be up there weeping again, you want to run. Because, <laughs> again, what happens is some, you see somebody crying. And the, initial, the thing inside of you is you want to go console them, you want to empathize with them, whatever. But but remember, you know, people are down at church when they're down there at church and they're down there at the altar. That that is some of the precious, most yes. precious time where the Holy Spirit, during worship time, the Holy Spirit can just literally change somebody's life. So again, here's there's just two examples. Uh, mm -hmm. Number one going up at the wrong time, but then number two saying totally the yeah, most right. inappropriate. Uh, thing to say. If if for some reason the Lord puts somebody on your heart that something's going on, it could be just for intercession. It doesn't mean you even have to go and tell everybody. Do you, know, do you realize that? He could just have you pray for someone. Because, you know, a, a prophetic word, you know, in 1 Corinthians 14, what does it do? It encourages someone, it exhorts someone, and it brings comfort to someone. You know, again, if you've got a word for someone and it doesn't have those three things, run that thing through the filter or flush the thing. Or the Bible says a prophecy is to be judged. Take it to someone else that you trust before you actually deliver that word. Because right. prophetic words are words of wisdom moving in the spiritual, uh, in those spiritual gifts. And, and that's what's sandwiched in this book right here is all these spiritual gifts. Won't have time to, to touch on that. You guys need to, to read those things. But the spiritual gifts are very, very, very powerful. And that prophetic word needs to be used at the right time because... Prophetic word can literally put somebody in a funk. That's right. It can have because some people write all their prophetic words down and they only are motivated by what their prophetic word is. And that I'm not saying that's right or wrong or indifferent, but a lot of times what you do whenever you get a prophetic word, you can't make that prophetic word happen. That's right. You get that thing to be comforted, to be encouraged and stuff, and then what happens is you can be sitting on the back row in church and God will still call you out. You know, bottom line is, you, if you got a purpose and a destiny and a call, and that prophetic word is there, God's going to bring that. God's going to bring that thing forward. So, just be really, really careful, and, and just take these examples, like Irene has said, in what you don't want to do um, in regards to an altar, because we can totally mess up on the. We can totally uh, get out of the flow and mess up what the Holy Spirit's doing in somebody's life. Angie, I'm, I'm, thank you. Um, what was your reaction to them when they when those when that happened? How I was you, praying. God, yeah, and I would, three times the same woman came up to me, but it was the worship, I was at the worship, and a couple of times I was over, under Pastor Sam, not actually, uh -huh. but I, the, I felt in the spirit that he was blowing the trumpet over wow. me, and wow. I felt healing, and I felt restoration, uh -huh. whatever the song was, I don't remember, so I would go to the, the east side of the church, because that's what I felt when the anointing would come up, and I would go, "Oh God, I can feel, I could feel it coming out of the trumpet." And she came up, and I said, "God, please remove her." Remove what would you tell them? Would you just ignore? Them? I was new here, and I didn't want to offend. And the lady that told me about um, the demonic and how Satan had me all night, and she knew I was offended. But I had a muffin. I had brought her a muffin. I said, "Here, I brought you a muffin. Goodbye." <laughs> <laughs> they so, followed me to the parking lot pastor said that's an indication if she, if like us as we're praying out there if it, you have to be receptive to what they're saying right yeah. in the spirit so if somebody's acting like a little dry then that's your sign that <laughs> might be the flesh so yeah. i just want i couldn't see. get away they're not going to be rude you know but i didn't want to offend and here yeah keep in mind what irene said she was new mm -hmm. that's another thing it's new. or it could be someone here. that mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. Uh, uh, maybe been out of church or maybe they've been a Christian for a long time but they've gone away and they're coming back and the other thing we don't want to do because the, because the power of the Holy Spirit moves so strongly and there's such a strong money we don't want to do anything that's weird yeah. mm -hmm. you know to uh, scare people or whatever because the deal is when whenever the Holy Spirit's moving it's I don't want to say it's weird enough but <laughs> but on on a person's physical body just you know the, the presence mm -hmm. what they feel, when they come into the light and they've been in darkness for a period of time, there's there's a distinct impression mm -hmm. that will, will come over people. And, and even us, keep, keep that in mind. Every single time you pray for someone or everything, whenever you're ministering stuff, you need to believe that what's inside of you 
that you can change an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So whatever that person might be going through or whatever is that you're believing that, that the Holy Spirit, not you change it, but I mean, mm -hmm. you know, because we're carriers of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit working through us uh, can actually change the atmosphere, the situation that's going on. I've had people start breaking out in a sweat when I'm praying for them, but I'll ask them, is it okay if I pray for you? I'll ask them, is it okay if I, can I, can I just hold your hand? Would that be okay? Or uh, could I just put a little bit of oil on your hand or maybe on your forehead? Um, I'm all, before I'm doing it, I'm asking if it's okay uh, for that. And that does not distract from what the Holy Spirit will do. Because, again, is it me that's doing it? No. no, no, it's the Holy Spirit that's doing it. And all I'm doing is I'm respecting and I'm honoring and I'm watching boundaries. Because sometimes people don't have good boundaries. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we've got to be so careful that we have good boundaries. The other thing is we got to be careful. We don't know what this other person who we might pray for, we don't know what their boundaries are. Especially women that might have been uh, abused or sexually abused, physically abused, uh, even emotionally abused, whatever. Or people that have gone through an abuse, they don't like a lot of touching. They I mean, don't even really like you holding their hand. you got to be very careful where you place your hand, especially guys. I always ask permission. And usually with ladies, I'm just usually holding their hand. <coughs> and, not, you know, and, and if for some reason I think there's an issue with a shoulder, a stomach, uh, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. I'll have the lady that's with me say, you know, just lay your hands on your stomach. And usually your Sherry's with me or something like that. You know, Sherry will do that. But I won't, uh, mm -hmm. I won't do that, even though I'm, I'm feeling that or sensing that because I'm thinking, okay, God, you know, you're bigger than me. You know, well, you have to, and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That anointing with oil, lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. I'm already holding that's their right. hand. You know, and I'm not Jesus, and yet I haven't been told to spit and do dirt and do all this and put the fingers in the ears. So I'd be very, I mean, if you got that kind of anointing, okay, cool, but if not, don't try it out on someone on the, on the altar. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We just, we, again, we've got to watch boundaries. You you have people that is new, and the thing is, we just, we don't know where they're at. If we've been running and gunning and flowing this thing for years, and we're just flowing the Holy Ghost, stuff like that. We have to be so sensitive to where somebody else might be, okay? Because the Holy Spirit can touch them with it, just a gentle touch. Yeah. Katrina. Yeah, and I, just last week I experienced the same thing. I'm on worship team, and there are just, you know, you're on team, and you're kind of on, you know, as a worshiper, we're up there. But there are times when the worship is so heavy that you get not to your knees. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, was just in a place with God where the reverence was so heavy for me. And whatever God was doing in my life, I was just so thankful and broken before him. I had to go down, but this person in the choir, bless her heart, she just rubbed my back the whole time. And I'm like, I'm before the king right yeah. now. You don't even need yeah. to be here. Don't she never me. said a word, but right. she didn't understand that I'm I'm wrapped in his presence right, right now. Yes. I don't care. Yes. Nothing else existed for me, but it's like she just kept stroking for a long time. I'm like, <laughs> Lord, get her, get her, Lord. I think, get her I think away from yeah. get to that, but just while Katrina said that, just let me say this. You know, one of the things that you never want to do. You don't want to rub somebody's back. You don't want to stroke somebody's hair. I mean, we've seen it happen so many times and we've actually written it in the book <laughs> as one of the things to, to not do. And again, what that is, is uh, again, what they were doing is they were empathizing with yes. you. It was coming more out of the soul realm because, you know, she's healing and maybe, I mean, maybe they really like you and, you know, so they're just wanting to rub, you know, yeah, what it is, yeah. it's a comforting thing. Yeah. But again, you know, Chapter John 14, 15, 16. What's, what's one of the Holy Spirit's names in those chapters? Comforter. 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 <laughs> and then no one can comfort like the Holy Spirit can comfort. So always remember that. And it's not as though, well, what are we supposed to do? Well, we're His hands and feet. We go and we take away the aloneness. But there's ways that you do it that doesn't put you into the soul realm mm -hmm. to where you're allowing the Holy Spirit through word of knowledge, word of wisdom, a prophetic word, or even just a prayer uh, that encourages and blesses, or even just standing with someone and you're just holding their hands. And you're saying, Lord, just let your presence increase. God, just let some of my prayers have just been, Lord, just increase your peace. Mm -hmm. And I start, you know, people start mm -hmm. wavering back and forth, or uh, a couple uh, guys that I prayed for, they totally start breaking out in a sweat. My hand start, not that my hand was getting hot, I don't have that manifestation. Some of you might have a manifestation when something like that happened. But they just, because what happens is, now inside there, you know, whenever supernatural God 
touches natural man, mm -hmm. guess who wins? <laughs> Supernatural God. Every time. Every and time. Your, your body, there you'll see all kinds of different manifestations when you're praying for someone. And I'll, I'll just say that to you so that when you do it, you're not, it doesn't take you back or whatever. And don't don't try to like, again, you always just want to stay in the spirit. Okay, well, I did that and I said that, so maybe I should just keep doing that. You know, just you always want to flow the spirit. And then whenever you feel like you're done, then just in Jesus' name, and then let them go and just say, just stand here or kneel here. Sometimes when they really are moving, I'll just say, why don't you just kneel down and, and just let the Lord continue to minister to you. And then you Amen. walk away. You walk away. And Amen. who's ministering to them? Just like what Katrina said, just like what Irene was saying, the Lord, the Holy Spirit ministers to them. When you were talking about you have to be careful, it's not just like us. I mean, we had an episode. We were in a ministry as volunteers for a year. And this was a pastor. And she started pulling him away from me. Mm -hmm. She had lost her husband recently. Mm -hmm. And she started pulling him away. And I was in this ministry, and we were supposed to be doing it together. And I would be sitting there, and she'd be dragging him all mm -hmm. over. And then all of a sudden, he started to feel uncomfortable. And I started to mm -hmm. see she was getting attracted to my husband. Mm -hmm. And I got up and I said, you know what? I'm done with this. I wasn't trained like mm -hmm. this. A woman should not be doing this with a man. Right. And I walked out. I walked out and I got in the car and he came out and I said, I'm done. If you want to stay in there and, and go through that, you go through that. But she's wrong. She's got some problems. Mm -hmm. And she's hanging on you a little too much. Mm -hmm. And he finally said. <laughs> Look at his face. And, well, he was finally. Just, well, he's so naive. He, he did, but he started to feel like when she would get close to him, she'd put her neck on his. Ah. And I'm thinking, hey, honey, you know. And she was doing this in the church, too. Because we went to the same church. And I thought, other people have seen her. You know, other people are seeing her. So finally, we just stopped the ministry. Right. And I told them, we will never minister apart like that again. No. It's not what God wants no. us. So what we do in regards to what um, uh, Karen's talking about here, and it is okay if you see someone doing that that you know that's not on the altar team or is not a chaplain or something like that, they're doing that. It's okay for you to go right alongside and just kind of get, just be right there with them and just kind of begin to interject and just kind of basically shut down Maybe what that other other person is doing, do it nicely. You know, obviously, you don't want to, you know, the person who's being prayed for, but but shut that down nicely. But we have, you know, Pastor Sherry, Pastor Jeannie is always uh, looking and stuff like that. Pastor Marie, they watch whenever we're doing uh, altar ministry to make sure things are flowing, you know, the right way and stuff like that. But if we see that, it's okay for you to go right up there at that time because Sherry and Jeannie can't be to every single place. And if we've got which we literally get a hundred and some odd people that are up at that altar, it is totally okay for you in regards to protocol and giving you the okay to do that, just to go and, and just kind of be there with that person. And then if you do see something, you know, let us know. And then what we have to do is we have to immediately talk to someone. We don't let those things mm -hmm. slide. You yeah. gotta talk because you gotta do education. And the other thing could be is that might have been the way they've just done it all the time and they don't have any training. So what we try to do is when Pastor Greg calls people forward, He'll, he'll, he'll call us forward, and that means no one else is to come forward except us. But sometimes different people will get a little bit, you know, they're caught up in the moment, the Spirit's really moving, and they want to pray for someone. But it is okay for you guys to um, go alongside with someone to even kind of help uh, interrupt that if you're, if you're seeing that. You know, or if they're even patting them on the back or whatever, we can just say, hey, it's okay, we don't, it is okay to say, it's okay, we don't need to do that. Let's let the Holy Spirit come mm -hmm. them, and they just start praying or something. Now that person that you just kind of spoke that to, but you did it very gently, you did it very nicely, it was only, I think I said seven words, maybe six words, they might get offended, but you know what? So what? Because what we need to do, then we need to talk to them a little bit more and, and educate them. So again, do it lovingly, do it kind, but if somebody's doing something that doesn't quite look right, it's okay to just go up there. And like I said, Sherry and Jeannie, Vicki, uh, Pastor Marie, they're always watching. Uh, they're watching the altar when when those things are going on. I'm and sorry. That's okay. Um, but that doesn't. Does that apply when we're like together? Uh, when he does the salvation, we go up there with our partner, and then there's a meal in line. Then that's different, or is it this? Yeah, that's a little bit different, especially if you have two. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what what I'm talking about, uh, male, male, female, female, is if it's just you single. Okay. But because we have groups up there, we don't have a guy in every single group. But yet a guy may come to your group to do that. And we've got two ladies. 
that's okay. okay. Here, the deal is you always want to have a multitude, you know, in case someone says, well, I was up there being prayed for and, mm -hmm. and blah, 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 uh -huh. said this. Mm -hmm. And if it was just you and just them, because that happens, okay, we've had that happen, mm -hmm. that they said this. But if someone else was there, uh, then it's like, you know, you, we know what's being said. We have two trusted people that we've got on a team that have gone through training. And then if someone says, hey, something was said, we can go back and talk to both of them. So what Angie's talking about, she's talking about in regards to the post-altar. Uh, after, after we've done altar ministry, and I'll, I'm going to talk about that here in a second so you guys can get the definitions because post-altar service ministry team is a new terminology. If you haven't, that, that terminology has not been around for a long time here. But after uh, Pastor Greg has done the salvation uh, thing, he's, we've done the, uh, people have come up to the altar at the end of the service. Now the service is ended. And we have the post altar teams that are up there. Everybody can go home, but there's some people that they just want, they just need a little bit more prayer. And that's kind of the verbiage that Pastor Greg will use. If you still need some prayer, our altar teams are available. He doesn't say post, he just says our altar teams are available. And, uh, or he might say something else, but we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, but if, if there's couples, that's cool. Here's another thing it's okay if there's three of you up there. You know, because it just depends. We don't know throughout the whole deal. We're still working this thing. We're still getting people used to coming up front because it's weird. It's a little bit uh, weird for people to move when Pastor Greg's doing the altar call. But we'll we'll talk about that. Um, but uh, once we get the teams up there, if there's two, then if a guy comes or a girl comes or whatever, that that's okay. That that makes sense. That that's okay in regards to that protocol. Okay. I also have that sometimes our partner will not be there. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, you know, doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. What I did when a man came up to pray that wanted prayer, I asked Steve to come over come and be with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Steve wasn't on team. Steve was just hanging out. I was in the front. So if you are by yourself for some reason and you didn't get over to another person or someone there, just look around and just call somebody's name. Okay. Because the deal is you're there. All it's doing is it's just bringing sure. multitude and, you know, accounts type right. of thing. Just grab somebody that's with you. It's... You know, it's totally, totally fine to do that. And, and you know, and you know who's been trained. Yeah. So. Yeah, you got a really good idea. So, okay. Praying Steve. with eyes open. You want to pray with yes. eyes open? That is really hard for Pastor Sam, but yes, we yes. always. <laughs> Me too. Me <laughs> too. Oh, you Jesus. want to pray with eyes? A lot of times, you want to pray with eyes open. Sherry does this really, really well. But you know, sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. But the reason you know you pray with eyes open, you can kind of see what's going on. You know that type That's of right. thing. But. Um, that's not a hard and fast rule, but but yeah, we when uh, Pastor Greg prays, he prays his eyes open. Yeah. Man, twenty eight some odd year, thirty years in Baptist background, you bow your head, close your eyes. I still, <laughs> yeah. I struggle with uh, my eyes open, you know, type of thing. But um, you know, if your eyes are closed, no one's going to mark you off on the book, you know, type of thing. But um, <laughs> as you grow in your prayer life and your prayer time stuff like that, and you do your ministry and stuff like that. You know, you're praying with your eyes open. If we were going into the prison and this is a prison ministry, I'd say pray with your eyes open. <laughs> yeah. uh, for sure. You're on the street, uh, pray with your yeah. eyes open, yeah. you know, type of thing. But in, And there's a dynamic just watching what God is doing, you know, in a person's life when you're praying with your eyes open. So, And that is one of the bullet points that's on there, to pray with your eyes open. Plus, it's a good idea in case someone's ready to fall over. Yeah, that's true. Grab a you can see where their hands are. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's right. So, and you're watching to see if some people are like saying. And uh -huh. one Wednesday morning when I was new, I came in and I, Pastor, let you speak on Wednesday, and I said that there was somebody because I've been worrying and praying and worrying and praying, and I didn't know who to speak to here, mm -hmm. you know. So I've been worrying and praying, and I was told by that same person that I wasn't saved and I was going to hell because I wore pants. So that would have been bothering me and bothering me and bothering me. We're talking eight years ago, seven, eight years ago. Anyway, I came up and Pastor Greg said, that, Sister Irene, and I said, somebody saying that we're going to hell and yada, 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 yada. So I said what I had been warring. I said what I had been praying for for months and whatever. Pastor Sherry came up to me when I finished and, went, and she said, Irene, was that a dream or did somebody really say that? It scared me so much. I thought I was in big trouble. I began to sob, sob, sob. And I thought, I'm in trouble and you're going to throw me out. And I said, I can't tell you. She said, Irene, tell me. She said, Pastor Don sent me up here to ask you. Mm -hmm. And I said, that, 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 that. I collapsed crying in her arms. Do you know why? 
because I got rid of it. Pastor right. Sherry came and got rid of this ugly secret. It was bothering so much that I would fight coming on Sundays and I would dodge them. Wow. Yes. Pastor Sherry came and she did. She didn't know how heavy I was carrying. She wanted to know if it was truth or a dream. And I said, I can't tell you. She, and she went like this. Yes, you can, Irene. Tell me. You know, in a private little corner. In a private little corner. In the whole sanctuary. A private little corner. Speaking in my ear. She, uh, Pastor Sherry took care of it. You know, you know, just something that she's talking about is Whoa. when people carry a secret, this is a counseling thing. Yes, please. But when people carry a secret, that is one of the most powerful weapons the enemy can yes. use in somebody's mm -hmm. life. Yes. They can rehearse that thing over and over and over yeah. again, and that person it will feel shame, guilt, condemnation. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you're talking with someone, sharing with someone, they begin to open up their heart, you know, just take that, help them break that um, secret. Mm -hmm. And a secret is powerful. A secret can actually affect someone's physical body. It can cause high blood pressure. Yes. It can cause all kinds of the wrong endorphins to be pumped uh, through your, your, into your body and stuff. So just as Irene was saying, that it just reminded me, hey, that's, that's another thing that we do. Just, that's just a little tidbit. You know, if you know someone who's got a secret or something's going on, just pray with them. Encourage them to get that off their chest. You'll bring more healing. Just the fact that they get that, the whole thing, that they get that off their chest. You know what? That's really a correct saying. Because they get that off of their chest, yeah. it gets that off of their heart, and they actually uh, become and feel light. Yeah, feel it was lighter. like a weight yeah. on me. Let's go to page 13 real quick, and we'll close off the altar portion. The conclusion of the altar, this is everything that we just kind of kind of talked about, but I'm just going to read through this. Uh, it says, God appears to us in a way that we can understand at the altar. We are given revelation out of our covenant relationship at the altar. It's a place for decisions and a place for guidance. It represents heavenly communication, not man's efforts to get God's attention. It's a place of personal sacrifice and offering. It's a place to be established in every place where we remember God. It's where God promises to come and bless us. And it's where we call upon His various names for our various needs. It's a place of repentance. It's a place of restoration. The altar is a very, very, very powerful area. So, and I just put this, I just put this here. We carry the altar of God with us wherever we go, not just at the front of the church. Amen. Now, that altar area we call, it is a designated area and stuff. But again, it's the person of the Holy Spirit that we carry with us that we can establish an altar no matter where we're at. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but mm -hmm. it's just something that is a conviction to me that i got to continually remind myself, no matter where I'm at or what I'm doing, because what is an altar? It's a place of remembrance, place of sacrifice, place of healing, place of reconciliation. So can that, can that not happen anywhere? It can happen anywhere. Now, we designate it in the front of the church, and we're identifying with that, but wherever you go, it can... All these different things that the altar did in the Bible, the, the different places, and how people were touched, and how the presence of God came, how the comfort, how revival came, all these different things, wherever you go, when you go and visit Thelma Crawford, uh, when you go and visit Alex uh, in his home, when you go into a hospital, it's a place, you're going in there believing that this is a place, you know, will God change this person's life forever when I walk into the room? You know, and sometimes you're planting seeds, sometimes you're watering, sometimes you're harvesting. Amen. Sometimes you'll see a full-blown uh, creative miracle take place. Other times you went in and you helped take away aloneness. I mean, we're always doing something, whether you see something happen or not. Wherever you go, wherever you pray for someone, something is taking place inside a person's life. Even when you're making phone calls, mm. that's a place that, at the yeah. altar. Believe because you can, you can know what the other person is going through. Because, you're, because you don't have to do anything. It's the Holy Spirit that's mm. ministering to them. Yep, absolutely. Okay, let's take out, let's take out this sheet here. i give you a couple different sheets. The one that's paper clipped. Um, this um, this came from Shirley. Shirley, explain this. What what uh, your sheet is here a little bit. Um, over the years, I collect pieces of scripture from the Bible that I'll use for prayer. And some of this, some I'm I'm, I'm sure that some of this came from Pastor Don. But I, I'll go through the Bible and I'll pick out um, scriptures, for example, for salvation. Mm -hmm. uh, some things that you can use mm -hmm. when someone comes to the Lord. There's scripture on here for healing. Um, mm -hmm. There's just, you know, 
I mean, I think I've just had this opportunity to give them some encouragement. And let's see. Yeah. I think those were the three. Mm -hmm. So there's just some scripture verses she's typed out you guys can have. Because, you know, here's the deal. Whenever we're praying, what you want to pray is you want to pray the word. Because where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. So whenever you're praying over someone, I don't care what the situation is, whether you need to bring comfort, whether they need healing, for them to hear that God heals, for them to hear that um, God rescues them out of all of their troubles. He's an ever-present help in a time of trouble. You know, uh, when, you, when you pray these different prayers, no matter what someone's going through, it begins to help because they're right in the middle of a situation, and they might kind of be stuck for a, for a, you know a moment or whatever. And when we pray those different prayers, and we're praying it by faith, we're praying the word of God. It brings encouragement. It brings faith uh, to the people that you're praying for. So you always want to kind of you want to, want to pray the word. Someplace in there, hopefully you're praying a, a scripture verse. Okay. Yeah, and, and this is really helpful too. But if, for example, if someone is crying and you're trying to comfort them at the same time, you're saying, okay, which Bible verse can I use? And so. You know, this this is also helpful that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, with with God, all things are possible. I mean, you know, the more you, the more scripture verses you know and understand, it's great. But some of them, man, if you just know with God, all things are possible. That's going to help in every single thing. And the thing is, it's a truth. You're not try, not just trying to make someone happy or feel better, but yet it does because with God, all things are possible. Now, as I get ready to start on this altar thing, this ministry thing, I just wanted to do one thing here. Turn to page 16 in your book real quick. You know, the, the middle part of this book, again, I've talked to you about this, session four, so basically it's verses 14, geez, all the way through uh, 24, all talks about the spiritual gifts, and the title of session 14 is Spiritual Gifts uh, for Altar Ministry Today. So all the different spiritual gifts, and it will give you... Uh, all the different uh, spiritual gifts that are in operation kind of explains about them. But turn over to page 16 real quick, right up at the very top. And what it's doing is um, it's talking about, I should say 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. Does everybody, does that, does everybody folks say that? Okay, about the third line in there. Um, I just try to explain this to all of our leaders all the time. What is spiritual gifts? What are they, what are they for? The, the spiritual gift is the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good of others. So why do we have spiritual gifts, and how do we operate? So that we can look powerful, so that we can, everybody can know that I have an anointing, so that everybody can say, well, wow, this guy has really gone up the ladder in his spiritual gift. He just full of spirit. No. Spiritual gifts are for the manifestation, for the common good of others. That comes out of the Word. That's what Paul wrote when he's talking to the church, and he's telling the church, hey, what are the spiritual gifts? Because they start operating, you know, as the church started functioning and operating, he wrote this to uh, the Corinthians church, because you, because when people can, when people start operating in a gift, they can kind of let it go to their head sometime. Mm -hmm. So don't let your spiritual gift go to your head, okay? And don't think that you're somebody, because that now I've got this spiritual gift. You know, just thank God thank that he gives these spiritual gifts for the common good of others, and he's chosen you. And, and which, which spiritual gifts can we have? Oh, oh. A-L-L. -L. Don't add anybody. No, somebody might operate in one gift uh, more predominant than the other, or someone might operate in the office of a prophet or whatever. Well, no, they're the only ones that can prophesy. No, they may operate in the office of that, or they may have the... Uh, uh, the affecting right. of miracles or signs and wonders and stuff, but that doesn't mean that we can't do the same thing or the same power of the Holy Spirit flow through us because the gifts were given to A-L-L, -L, all men, for the manifestation of the common good for others. So why were the spiritual gifts given? For other people. Mm -hmm. So the Lord could use us to touch other people. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say that, and, you know, whatever spiritual gifts you guys have, Operate in them, read these, understand what these are uh, so that you can flow in them. And if you don't have them or there's some that you don't have, just say, Lord, I want to increase. I would like to give more prophetic words. Lord, I want more. I'd like to have more word of wisdom type of thing. It, one of those things, it is, uh, you know, there, it's a gift that God gives. It's free. And I think the more you use it, you know, the, the more that it will continue to flow through you. I've just found that in any, any type of thing that we do or any type of gift we use, the more we step out and the more we walk in faith in that, the more God will continue, I think, will continue to grow. Because basically what we do is we grow in it. 
It's not that, okay, now I got more favor because God really likes me because I did that. No. But it's that you're stepping out in faith and you're allowing God to use you. Katrina. You, you see my face. This is bugging me to ask this. Like, how, <laughs> even in that knowing that it's not you, it's the Holy Spirit, there's still that human flesh part that you battle with that, oh, my God, God is using me working through me to do yeah. like laying hands and slaying somebody in the spirit <laughs> you can get such a big head doing that and you're not trying to but after, like you get disappointed when they don't fall out you know it's right. still your flesh battling to take credit although you know and you're telling yourself holy spirit is doing this i know that but your flesh is still kind of trying to take credit and the more you do it i think the more you battle that yeah, the, the stronger you grow mm -hmm. and and you just go on laying hands and then when somebody doesn't fall out you're like wait a minute, I, I got to keep praying for him longer. So it, how do you like really win that battle over your, I mean, is it, does it go away at some point where you mature and, or no? Well, I, you know, I don't think it ever goes away, but what happens is, and you've probably all found out as you're growing in your, in your, in your Christian walk, you, you continue to go to levels and levels. And every time you go to another level, what, what continually happens, then another level of humility mm -hmm. comes in, another level of mm -hmm. sacrifice comes in. You find, oh, I thought pride was gone. Doggone it. You know, it's, it's not or whatever. So does that ever go away? No, it just really never goes away. But the more and more you do things and the more you really understand the Holy Spirit's doing that, you can battle that more. Like uh, every Wednesday night when I'm driving home, I thank God for whatever happened on Wednesday night. Even if it went off the charts and I'm like, yeah, you know, that was great or whatever. I do not want to come back the next Wednesday night and it'd be a flat tire. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's like, it's like, you know, if, if God like removes his little finger just for one second, you're like, where are you at, God? You know, right. and so you always want to know that it's the Holy Spirit that does that. He's just using us. So you'll always battle that in your flesh because your flesh always want your flesh always cries. Your flesh is a baby. Your flesh. You all know your, your flesh never grows up. Okay, but you can put your flesh into submission more and more the more we continue to grow. But the thing is, what what did what did what did the devil say? Whenever he tempted Jesus, okay, and the spiritual authority that Jesus had, what he did, he went did baptism, went out, he was tempted all those different times. The very last line in that chapter, does anybody remember what the what the last like one of the last lines it was? What the devil said he was going to do? Does anybody remember? Mm -hmm. You'll remember when I say it. This is what he said. He would look for another opportune time. That's right. So he tempted him all those different ways, and Jesus combated him with the word on every single one of those things. But the maturity level, what it says, what, and he found nothing in him. So that he would look for another opportune time. So there's going to be times when the enemy is going to find nothing in you. But what will he do? Oh he will return for another opportune time, maybe when you got a weak moment or something. Because he did with Jesus in the garden. When there, sweated, there you like, go. If we'll this come. cup could pass me, please take it. You know, that's the enemy bringing that, that So fear. to the last day in Jesus' life, or, and I, I wasn't the last day, but but at the, in the end of the thing, did the enemy ever leave him alone? Did you ever get to a point where the enemy wouldn't try to do something or try to cause him to... Uh, I mean, he healed the guy's ear when he's being accused falsely. He gets beaten, whipped beyond recognition, the word says. And what does it say? He was like a lamb being led to the slaughter. He uttered no word. He uttered no word. That is a level of maturity that, oh my gosh, it's a target out there for us to, to look at and, and to hit, you know, considering others' interests above our own. So... You'll always be, and again, Katrina, and just everybody here, as those spiritual gifts will increase, you've, you've got a level where you've really got to watch. If you start reading some of the uh, uh, fathers of the faith, women of the faith, and stuff like that, you'll find that they worked in uh, some miraculous signs and wonders, but they had some things of their flesh that brought them down, whether it could be alcoholism, whether it was prescription drug abuse. These are people who go out and would see miraculous things happen, but yet they, they drank and they, you know, they had other problems in their in their flesh realm. I and mean, what happens towards maybe towards the end of their ministry, that thing started to wane even that much more. Why? I was looking for an opportune time, and maybe that opportune time. I don't want to set up any judgments. I'm just That's telling good. you books that I've read and histories, yeah. things that I've read. What we have to do is we have to watch because the higher you go, the more of a pedestal you get put on. The more people will look at you. So what is that? You know, that could become pride and arrogance. And does it feel good to your soul, man? Does it feel good to your flesh? Sure, absolutely does. 
You know, when people recognize that, people start calling on you. Oh, it's like they're calling on me. So I gotta go. But the thing is, do you always have to go? At the expense of what? At the expense of who? You know, so those are just things that we have to get a good balance. And we always remember, what are these gifts for? For the common good of others. You just have to remember that the enemy is like a pesky mosquito. Yes. <laughs> always, never, never will stop on this. You know what I try to do, and, and it works. It, I'm finding that it works. Before I pray for anybody or I even come to church, we get into worship, but I always ask God, I want to die to flesh today. Please kill the flesh so that nothing mm -hmm. comes through. And I shared last week how I was ministering to my best friend in, in Pennsylvania. And she texted me this week that she had a meeting with her boss. And she said, in 20 years, every time I go in there, I come out crying. And he it screams and yells and swears at her. She's head over all the, the cleaning department in the hospital. So I sent her a prayer. And before I did that, I said, flesh be gone. Mm -hmm. And only allow the Holy Spirit to move. And I started her, t told her to start decreeing her atmosphere. And I decreed mm -hmm. it for her. She kept texting me throughout the day. I'm reading this over and over and over again. Well, she calls me at 5.30, and she goes, I can't believe this. And I go, what? And she said, I went in there, he didn't yell. <laughs> it's 20 years, Karen. I said, do you see the power of God when you decree positive? She goes, I'm seeing that. Now, this is a girl that's been a Methodist for 20 years. And I told her, I said, I know some of the stuff that I'm teaching you seems far-fetched. Mm -hmm. I said, but it's things I've lived and I've learned, and it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just, I just ask God, just don't let any flesh get in there. Exactly, and, and that's that's all. I, that's all I got to do. You just got to keep in mind, because you know when you start self talking yes. and mm -hmm. self promoting, and we all know mm -hmm. when when we do that. And then I just what will happen is when you mature, you'll catch yourself quicker than letting it go for a longer period of time. So when the, the older you get in the Lord, you know you're like, what am I, what am I saying? Mm -hmm. You know, what am I doing? You know, type of thing. That wasn't even me. You know, it's, it's the gift that flows, you know, through me. It's like, thank God. So that just gets more and more. So, it, again, it's just a battle of mind, you know, when you, that's going you, on. You made a, a good point cause about how people, if you're not careful, God will kind of withdraw some of the giftings. You won't be. I, I had some giftings early in my Christian walk, so I was immature, and I was going to to Africa and casting out demons and I was not mature enough to handle that and I suffered repercussions when I came back and almost had to like God I had to re-earn God's trust back with certain mm -hmm. gifts because mm -hmm. of just being immature yeah. you know and well, you, can, you can lose self-confidence you know you go on the mission field I mean that's just a culture thing anyway going on a mission field coming back in Africa where the demonic is so prevalent, the light, the light has to be so much greater, mm -hmm. and we don't see that as much here in America, so you go overseas, you go to India, you go to Africa, you mm -hmm. come back, you, have a, you literally have a culture shock even though you're an American, mm -hmm. but in regards to Christianity, because you're like, well, what's wrong with people? Well, why aren't they getting set free, and why doesn't everybody else see this? And that's a whole, that's a whole nother thing mm -hmm. about debriefing. When people come back from these mission trips that uh, are in really role of the demonic and you've done a lot of deliverance or you've seen a lot of healing. I've seen that happen a lot of times, even to where it can short circuit a person's uh, faith in God and they can actually go backwards after they've actually come up with an extremely, but extremely she powerful. She still has the gifts, right? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Those well, gifts don't well, go what anywhere. was happening is like is I, I had a strong prophetic anointing. And for like a few years, it kind of diminished because I had gotten into such a prideful place with God where I would begin to challenge God about some stuff in my life and get, be indignant. And I did not hear prophetically for a few years. It took me like that relationship I could tell. But it wasn't like God left me at all. No. It was like, I love you, but you you got to earn this trust back with this yeah. stuff now. And what ends up happening, folks, is I'm going to kind of say it like this. It's usually a heart issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's usually a heart issue. So when our heart gets, because does God ever huh. say, he'll never leave us, nor forsake us. Mm -hmm. So he don't go nowhere. What happens is we change the we change the dials on the radio station, yes. you know, because we think we might know something a little bit. And so you, we got to get that dial back. And how you get that dial back is just spending time, just being with the Lord, humbling yourself, uh, allowing him to let you recognize. And, and it's hard sometimes we need somebody to point that out to us uh, when we might be walking in uh, the natural, walking in the flesh, and don't really realize maybe we have a little bit of arrogance or we have a little bit of pride or 
water because a lot of times we can really make it look on the outside like we're just everything's really good, you know, that type of thing, when really we got some inner stuff going on. So usually I would say almost all the time, it's usually an attitude, absolutely. you know, the heart that gets changed. So and sometimes right. you really have a blind spot. Uh, yes, you can oh absolutely everybody can have that. All right, let's go to this uh, altar and post altar ministry uh, sheet right here. I'm going to go over this first because I'm going to run out of time. I can see it already. <laughs> I hope this is good, though. Is this helping everybody yeah, with, uh, with oh, this? Good. What we're doing now is we're kind of going into um, um, actually what you'll be doing when you're on an altar ministry team. So the very first page should say altar ministry. The top of it should say altar, pulse altar, chaplain duties. It should say altar ministry team. True? Yes. Okay, I'm going to explain what a altar ministry team is. As you guys are taking this uh, class and you're becoming a chaplain, uh, what are we in right now? This is, uh, we're in October. Uh, November schedule is probably already done. You guys will go on a December schedule, be on the December schedule where we'll be on the altar ministry, okay? So everything I'm talking about, or the two things I'm talking about today, post altar and altar, you guys will go on the schedule in December, okay? So we've got a month where we can keep asking questions and I'll keep reminding y'all uh, about this and stuff. All right, altar ministry team. The altar ministry team, we are always on call during the service. So, being an altar minister, Greg can have, uh, Pastor Greg can say, um, uh, it can happen during worship, it can happen during the end of the service. However the service is flowing, whenever there's ministry that needs to be done, uh, mm -hmm. we need to be listening. You are on the altar ministry team, okay, because you're a chaplain, all right? So, this usually happens during the worship time or at the end of the service. Pastor Greg will call the congregation people up front uh, to be prayed for. Um, uh, where am I here to be prayed for? Okay, uh, pastor will then call for, he'll say this, he'll say, my ministers, my leaders, my chaplains, my pastors, or prayer team. I don't know what he'll say on any given time, but as you now, as your, your ears are being trained to hear this, you'll hear all these different things. And no matter what the description of the title that he uses, who's he talking about? Us. us. He's talking about you. He's talking <laughs> about us. Basically what he's saying is, in whatever he's going in his mind, he's calling out for every safe person or team that he can think about. Even if he just says, I want my pastors to come forward. That's all of you guys. I want the ministry team. I don't remember. Am I a ministry team? I don't remember being called ministry team. It does not matter. Whatever it is, because at one time or another, all these little titles I've put down here, these are what we've called different teams. So depending on what's going on, whatever he's saying, all he's saying is, hey, everybody that's been trained out there, I need your help. Come and help me. But is it going to be just coming up or based on the schedule for us? On this on this right here. Okay, good question. Thank you. Altar ministry team. See the, the very first thing? You're always on call during that service. Okay. So as an altar thing, as a pastor, as a chaplain, you're always on call whenever, the alt, whenever we're doing something uh, during the worship time or during, uh, like at the very end of his service and he has a lot of people come up doesn't do that all the time, yeah. but he, he may come, and sometimes he has people come up, but he doesn't ask for anybody to come up and pray. He just has them coming up by faith to stand. Right. Right. They say all the prayer. Doesn't necessarily mean we're on. Right. Now he says, now I've got you up here. Now my leaders, now my ministers, is usually kind of how he says it. Uh, now they're going to pray for you. That, that means us, okay? Mm -hmm. So this thing is, there's no schedule for that because okay. what happens during the worship time, the altar time, there's a hundred and some odd people up there. So we need everybody to to pray. And, and when we're praying on something like this, I don't know if I'll get to this or not, but you're only praying like a two-minute prayer, three-minute prayer. Don't use this time as a time to counsel or uh, give all kinds of advice. Again, they're at the altar. They're meeting with God. Something's going to happen. And we're believing that the Holy Spirit's going to touch through this, and the Holy Spirit can do that with a two or a three minute, mm -hmm. uh, with a three minute prayer. Okay? Because the other thing is, we have so many people, we want to make sure that everybody gets touched. And if you listen to someone for twenty minutes and then you pray for ten minutes, the service is over. Okay? I know that was kind of far fetched, but understand, understand what I mean. Okay. Thank you, Katrina. That was very, very good. So during the altar ministry, so during worship, and at the very end of the service. Uh, when Greg's doing an altar call for everybody to come forward, he may ask for us to come forward. And he may not. He may ask people to come forward during the uh, service time, and he may not ask for any ministers, okay? So this is 
you know, not this is either or, not both, you know, you know what I'm saying? So it's not a cut and dry type of thing, but your ears are always listening. So my very first thing, you're always on, but you're listening for instructions. So when he calls for ministers or whatever verbiage he uses, that's us, we come forward, okay? So if there isn't a specific reason issued by the pastor that we are to pray for uh, with people, you should ask the question. So if he doesn't come up and say, hey, we're praying for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, he usually gives direction. If he doesn't, people are just coming up, we're just going to have our ministers to come up. You just come up and then what you say, how can I pray for you today? You know, that's just a very simple thing to always remember. How can I pray for you today? Okay? Uh, don't use this time to counsel or do a lot of talking. Find out what the prayer need is and then begin praying, believing that the Lord is going to heal their physical body or touch their heart and bring healing and or deliverance to their emotional realm. Okay? So if it's not salvation, they've got their healing, they've got a physical realm, and then they've got their emotional realm that God can heal. Everybody agree with that? Yes. Okay. Here's the other thing. Don't start praying for people until Pastor Greg is done giving instruction yes. or direction yes. or even that he's finished praying for people on a corporate level. He may do this. He may get you up there. He may say, don't pray yet. Sometimes you've heard him say that. What he's saying is he has something to say corporately to everybody that's come up there and then he will possibly pray for them corporately out loud. Then he'll release us and say, 